Good morning. I'm very honored to have been asked to speak with you today. And I will tell you an incredible story of survival. And we will have some time for questions, I hope. So I'm going to begin just before the war. I was born in Poland, as were my parents. And in order to give you an idea of what life was like for Jews, Jewish people, before the war in Poland, um, it's important for you to know a little bit about that, because if not, then you don't know what was lost. So, my parents were born in a small town called Sandomierz, which you see here on the map is just below Warsaw. Warsaw is the capital of Poland today, and it was the capital before the war as well. So Sandomierz is a small, very med medieval, very beautiful town. The population of Sandomierz was mostly Catholic, because Poland is a Catholic country. But about um, one-third of the population sorry, was Jewish. And the Jews of Sandomierz lived in relative peace, and friendship with their non-Jewish neighbors. My parents were distantly, distantly related. Oh, before that, let me tell you about this. this is what you see here on the, here, is a tower. It's in the middle of the square in the medieval town of St. Domiers. Most uh, old towns and cities in Europe have um, a square in which all kinds of things happen, usually festivities and celebrations. But this building has a very dark history because during the war, hundreds of people were shot at its walls. Over here you have an overview of St. Omish, a very beautiful city as you see, very well preserved. And here is a building that housed both my parents' families and the store that my mother's father owned, owned right here, it was a shoe store. That was what he did to earn money. Didn't do so well with it either. He wasn't such a great businessman. My parents were distantly related, and here you have a photograph of some members of both their families. So here you have my father, whose name is Antek or Anthony or Abram, depending on which part of his life you're talking about, because he had many identities, as you'll hear in my story. Right here is my mother. Her name is Fella. And beside her is a woman whose name is Regina. Regina Banker. Regina was my mother's closest friend and also her first cousin. She's very important in this story. So see if you can remember her name, Regina, because without her, I wouldn't be here today to speak with you. Here you have, and I told you they were related, so there's all kinds of members of family here. Um, this is my father's brother, Stanley. This is my mother's brother, Henry. Both of them survived. Henry was a surgeon, um, and he survived in Russia. Um, my uncle Stanley was hidden during the war and was saved by um, efforts made by my father and a cousin of the family as well. In fact, you have two younger girls. They're both sisters. One, this is my father's sister, and beside her is my mother's sister. Uh, this is my Aunt Sophie, and this is my Aunt Gert. Gert survived in the United States because she and her husband, who was also a doctor, um, came from Italy. Her husband had tried to study medicine in Poland, but he was not admitted to university, and I'll explain to you a little bit later why. Um, so they immigrated to New York, where my, uh, my mother's father had a sister who had immigrated before the war, well before the war. So my Aunt Gert spent the war years in New York and her husband joined the American Army and fought during World War II. He was stationed in Japan, in fact. My father was the oldest... My father was the oldest of six siblings, my mother the oldest of five. And as was the custom of the day, if, and if a family was struggling financially, as my father's family was, and there wasn't much money, then if you were going to educate one person in your family, one of your children, it was always the oldest son. Sons were more valued than uh, daughters. Fortunately, that's no longer the case. But my father was 
And my father's ambition was to work in the fur industry. He wanted to go to university and become a chemical engineer. And he could not get into university in Poland because there was discrimination against Jews. If you were Jewish, you had a very, very slim chance of being able to study in university. Um, because um, there was anti-Semitism, which is really, I can define it very shortly, there are longer, longer definitions, but I can tell you that it's a hatred of Jews. Um, in fact, during the same time here in Canada, there, were discrimin there was discrimination against Jewish students as, as well, because there were quotas or uh, limited numbers of students admitted to various faculties if they were Jewish. So, to give you an example, out of 120 students admitted to McGill University uh, for medical school, uh, 10 were Jewish, and that was until the end, way past the war, it was till 1960. So my father was admitted to a university in Liège, in Belgium, um, where he learned to speak French, and where he became a chemical engineer, and when he um, finished his studies, he returned to saint and he and my mother married, and they moved to Warsaw, where they found a beautiful apartment in a lovely area just outside of town, and they looked forward to a, a, a good life um, in Warsaw, which was very different than saint which was a small town. Warsaw was cosmopolitan, it had museums, it had a theater, it had all kinds of advantages for them, and they were uh, looking forward to that. But we begin now, at one of the most horrific times in modern history, Warsaw, Poland, 1939. I don't think I have to explain this picture to you. This is my mother, my father, and me. By the time I was born, in February 1940, Poland and her neighbors we're in the middle of one of the most horrible periods in human history. Never before had a government, a democratically elected government, like the one that we have in Canada, democratically elected, designed a systematic and terrifying plan to eradicate, to eliminate, to wipe off the map without any trace an entire people. And it was not only the Jews, it was mainly the Jews, but it was not only the Jews. And as you heard when um, Dr. Phillips spoke to you, uh, it was the Jews, but it was also the Roma, and sometimes they were called the Gypsies or Sinti, um, disabled people, homosexuals, political opponents. Um, all of these people were declared to be subhuman. The Aryan race, which was typically tall, blue-eyed, blonde, Germanic-looking, was the ideal, and everyone who didn't look like that was lesser, was less valued as a contributor to society. Now you've seen, those of you who haven't before, at least this morning, you've seen pictures of Hitler. Was Hitler of the Aryan race? He was short, he was dark-haired. He would not have looked out of place in any one of the concentration camps that his regime established. And yet that question is never raised. That comparison is never made. There were 3.5 million Jews in Poland before the war. That was because Poland, for a thousand years of its history, with Jews before that, had been good to its Jewish population, and so the population flourished. So there were two and a half, I'm sorry, 3.5 million Jews in Poland before the war. During the course of the war, which was 1939 to 1945, Two-thirds of that number were murdered. Soon after conquering Poland, the Nazis began to segregate the Jews into ghettos, and you heard before what a ghetto was. It was an area of the city separated from the rest of the city, which was like a, a prison. The largest of these ghettos, and of which there were many, many, many in Poland and other countries in Europe, the largest of them, of them in Poland was in Warsaw. In roughly 30 square blocks, think about the neighborhood that you live in, in roughly 30 square blocks, where before the war, maybe the 30 to 40,000 people had lived, the Nazis forced in excess more than 400, 
thousand people to live in the same square area. You can imagine the conditions and how crowded things were. Think about the size of your room. Think about five people, six people, seven people living in your room, not in your house, in your room. They were forced to work as slave laborers. They were deprived of food, of space, of freedom, while being tortured and abused by their captors. The infrastructure, such as the sewage disposal facilities and the, the potable water supply, which was engineered to meet the needs of 30 to 40,000 people, could not cope with the, such a huge population of over 400,000. And very soon, overflowing human waste ran freely in the streets of the ghetto. This is my aunt, Sophie. That's one of the little girls in the other, in the other uh, uh, photo that I showed you. And this is when she brought me to St. Domingue from Warsaw to see my grandparents. And this is, I'm sure, the last time I ever saw them. They perished during the Holocaust. And it's the last time she saw her parents as well. This is just an idea about the ghetto, how the ghetto was separated from the rest of the city. You see this large wall, 10 feet tall, made out of bricks, and on top of it is an electrified barbed wire, separating the ghetto and the population of the ghetto from the rest of the city. People rapidly began to die of diseases caused by the unbearable conditions, the dirty water, the sewage, Tuberculosis, which is a disease that destroys the lungs. Dysentery, which robs your body of water. And you might know that most of our body is composed of water. It doesn't look like it, but that is a fact. And especially little children are very, uh, very susceptible to dying of this disease. And it's a rapid disease. Typhoid fever, cholera, lice, rats, and vermin of all kinds helped to spread the diseases. There was not a family that did not suffer the loss of one or more members on a daily basis. Meantime, while they were packing as many people as they could into the ghetto, the Nazis were very busy. They were preparing their killing camps. The closest of these to Warsaw was a camp, was a camp in Treblinka, called Treblinka. And here's some of the conditions of the ghetto that I explained to you. You see people dressed in rags, Poland's winters are as cold as ours. Today, I'm sure when you were outside, you thought it might be, it's quite cold. It's gonna get a lot worse here, and Poland's climate is not different than ours. So people had no shoes, they had rags for clothing, they were starving, they were crowded, they were sick. Children were often left alone because their parents had died. The conditions were unbearable. In Treblinka, the camp that they were preparing, the killing camp that they were preparing, the Nazis, even though they were very well known to keep very close records, as you heard, they were very meticulous in keeping records. In Treblinka, they did not keep records of the names of the people that they were killing, because there were simply too many. In their evil wisdom, the Nazis had established a Jewish government of sort, which are called councils, and you heard a little bit about that before. These councils were made up of community leaders, Jewish community leaders from before the war. They had absolutely no power except to enforce the laws of the Nazis, the rules of the Nazis, the demands of the Nazis. So one day, in 1942, when I was two years old, my mother and I, along with other women and children, many other, hundreds of other women and children from our part of the ghetto, who herded to a place called Uschlagplatz in the ghetto for what the Nazis euphemistically called them. In other words, they were trying to make it sound better than it was. They called it resettlement. And they told people, and the Jewish council was told to tell people, was ordered to tell people, that conditions would be better, that they would have more food, that they would have better working conditions and living conditions. And some people believed that. So this was a place where the train tracks ran along the side of the ghetto, the border of the ghetto. 
and people were brought there, as you see. And in, in, in um, this picture, you see people being herded, like cattle, to the Tunstadtplatz, which is here. And the, the tracks are just, just beyond this. And here you have people, huge groups of people waiting to be uh, loaded onto cattle trains. These are not via rail, for those of you who've trained, taken the train. These are cattle cars designed for the transport of animals and not very humanely. There was no toilet facility, there was no water, and they could crowd over 100 people into each car. People were packed so tightly that even if they fainted or even died, they could not fall. So one day, in 1942, I believe it was in September, my mother and hundreds of other women, as I told you, with children, were herded to Ushtar Plaza. To be loaded onto these trains. My mother's cousin, Regina Banke, remember I asked you to remember her name, who worked as a slave, everybody in the ghetto who worked, worked as a slave, forced labor. When she was alerted to the fact that we had been rounded up, she left her post, she was wearing a uniform, and she ran to Jungslag Platz. And when she got there, she saw hundreds of women and children, a lot of crying, a lot of screaming, a lot of fear. She looked around frantically. And had she got there a minute before or a minute after, she would have missed us. But as she looked around, she could see my mother holding me in her arms, being forced onto one of the cattle cars. When she saw this, she ran to that cattle car and started to scream at the top of her lungs that I was her child and that my mother was only minding me. And I don't know why. It's a miracle, the first of many miracles of my survival. I don't know why my mother was permitted to pass me hand to hand, hand to hand, until I was thrown out that cattle car into Regina's arms. And the doors of the cattle car eventually closed, and that train, and many hundreds of others like it, pulled away. No one ever saw my mother again. She was murdered with countless others, within one hour of her arrival at Treblinka, where over 900,000 people were murdered in the span of 16 months. I was two years old. You can see here. Oops, sorry. Here's a picture of my mother and Regina. I think this is my most precious possession because I have nothing that she actually touched. I only have her image. And the reason I have these images is because my Aunt Gert, that I told you about who survived the war in, in, in America, in New York, had taken these pictures when she left Poland and others were sent to her by my father and other relatives. So she preserved these pictures and she gave them to me. That's how I have them to show you. Regina's courage at this moment and the choice she made against all odds, which could easily have led to her own instant death, takes my breath away, even to this day. Only as a mature adult did I truly understand the unimaginable decisions and courage made by Regina and by my mother that day. To pass a beloved child off in order to take a tiny, infinitesimal, tiny, tiny, teeny little chance that she might survive. Certain death. A choice that is so unnatural for a mother. Think of your mother. Think of your father. Think of people who love you. The instinct of a mother, a parent, 
is to hold their child close, hold them in their arms, to protect them with their own lives, with their own bodies if necessary. My mother made the other choice, and it was a choice which was unbelievable, unbelievably heroic under the circumstances, going against every instinct in her body. Every day, the Nazis ordered hundreds of people to be gathered together and taken to Uschlagplatz for what they call resettlement, meaning transport to Germany. If there weren't sufficient numbers, the orders would say they needed 500 people, 400 people, 350 people. If there weren't enough people that were gathered, and these were gathered by Jewish police on the orders of the council, the Jewish council, which had to do it because of the orders that came down from Nazis, who were the directors, really, of the, of the, of the ghetto. If there weren't enough people, and people were, and the, 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 the gatherers was, were sent into the homes, into the houses, and people were dragged out to join the parade. If there wasn't enough, even then, then sometimes members of the council themselves would be forced to, to go along with this group. When such orders were given, People scattered like rats. If you happen to be out in the street, people scattered like rats looking for any place to hide in a cellar, in an attic, under a staircase, in a closet, wherever they could. It was a desperate search for safety. Very quick, you had to find a place immediately or you were gathered up. My father and I, one day, were out in the street when such an event took place. And the call came out for hundreds of people to be gathered. My father was fortunate enough to find a staircase leading to the cellar of a building. And as he descended that cellar, he saw other people. It was already full with people who were terrified as well. And they started to scream at him, go away, go away. You can't come here with a young child. He was holding me in his arms. And they said, you have a little girl, you have a little child here. And if the child cries, she'll give everybody away. It's no use, go, go find some other place. And my father begged him, please, he said. There's no time for me to find another place. I promise you that I will hold her very close. And if I feel her making any sound, trying to make any sound, I promise you that I will suffocate her myself. I don't know if you can imagine such a thing. It's hard to imagine. Impossible, in fact. He told me many years later that he always carried throughout the war two pills in his pocket. They were pills that were cyanide, which is a very powerful poison. He was very prepared to give me one of those pills and to take the other himself. He was that determined not to have the Nazis capture us alive. I was a child of war. I was a child of war. So I had learned to do what I was told. I have no doubt that I had no understanding as a two-year-old of the circumstances of our life, the tragedy of our life, the difficulties, the, 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 the obstacles, the, the daily stress and trauma. I had no idea of that. But I did feel the anxiety, I did feel the fear, and I had learned that I had to do what I was told because our very survival often depended on it. So I was quiet throughout that night, and we survived. But my father knew that if we weren't caught today, we would be caught tomorrow. If we weren't caught this week, we would be called, caught next week. He made the terrifying decision to attempt to escape from the ghetto, where life, as I told you, had become simply unendurable. There were few possibilities, otherwise a lot of people would have escaped. The one possibility that was referred to very brief, briefly in one of the uh, videos that you saw before was escape through the sewers. In fact, the sewers were a kind of conduit because people like Irena Sendler and that, that um, uh, organization that she worked with, Jagoda, uh, smuggled arms, guns, and often smuggled babies, as you heard, through the sewers. My father decided that he would try to escape with me through the sewers. It was a monumental decision. Because if you were caught, if somebody saw you going into the sewer, even somebody else in the ghetto, it's not a Jewish person, and if they alerted the authorities, if they denounced you to the authorities, 
you will instantly killed. And you think, when we sit here in our very safe country of Canada, when we sit here and we think about that, we think, how could a person do that? That's terrible. How could a person do that? But we mustn't be too quick to judge, because if that person was offered some food to keep their family alive another week, another day, maybe they did it for that reason. And maybe, if God forbid we were in those circumstances, we might have done the same. We can't judge them because we're not living in those times and hopefully we never will. So as I said, we're very fortunate to live in this country, one of the best countries in the world. And it's not that Canada has no blemishes. The way we treated our indigenous population over many, many years. Also the way that our borders were closed to refugees from World War II, Jewish refugees. These are blemishes. These are dark black spots on our history. But overall, we are very fortunate to live here. I hope that you're grateful every day I am. Maybe because I was born elsewhere and had these experiences, but it's something that I'm grateful for every day. So my father called my aunt Sophie, his sister, who lived on the outside of the ghetto. Of course, she was Jewish like we were, but she had what was called Aryan papers, or false identity papers. Those papers gave her a name and an identity, a history, a family, a job, uh, an identity that was totally different from hers, a Christian identity. And she passed as a Christian, even though she was Jewish. She didn't, uh, she didn't have dark hair, she, she had blue eyes, she was very pretty, she was young, and she was able to, to pass as a non-Jew. My father asked her to find someone who could pick us up when we exited from the ghetto, because it was possible, very dangerous, as I said, but possible, to enter the sewer within the borders of the ghetto and to walk in the sewer until you were outside of the borders of the ghetto and to exit at that point. And I told you what the sewers were like. They were filled, very, very full, of human excrement. My father carried me in his arms, like this, as high as he could raise his arms. He said that the distance we traveled in the sewer probably would take 20 minutes if we were walking on the sidewalk on the street, but it took over two hours for us to get to where we were supposed to be picked up. And you could just imagine what we looked like, what we felt like, what we smelled like when we exited the sewer. The man who was there to pick us up took us to the home of a family of friends of my father's from before the war. Their name was Rondio. When they saw us, they were horrified. They were horrified at what happened to my mother, and they were equally horrified to see what we looked like the condition that we were in. We were starving, we were filthy, we smelled awful. They invited us in. They invited us in, they allowed us to wash up, they fed us, and they assured us that we could stay with them for as long as necessary. Of course, my father knew that it was very generous of them, very kind, but it wasn't possible. We could not stay with them because it was absolutely against Nazi law to offer any kind of help or assistance to a Jewish family or person. And if they were found out, they would be instantly killed, as would we. We were endangering their life every minute that we were with them in their home. My father went to see a friend of his from before the war, the pediatrician who had looked after me, and he begged him, please, his name is Dr. Landy, and he asked Dr. Landy, please, could you find a place for Eva, this little girl, me, the age of two, to be a little safer than she is in war. So nothing in Poland was safe. Poland was at war. It was a country being destroyed. And the Poles also suffered quite a lot during the war. And he begged him, please could you find a safer place? And Dr. Landy said that he would try. Because my father had decided that when he escaped from the ghetto, he would use all his energies, all his resources, to help protect members of our family who need to have places in reserve where you could move people who were in hiding so that they would not, they would not be caught. And so my father decided that this is what he would devote his energy to for the rest of the war. Of course, he couldn't do that, looking after a two-year-old child. So Dr. Nandi came and he took me to the home of a, a wonderfully kind, amazing woman whose name is Hanka Rambowska. Hanka was an illustrator of children's books and she agreed to take me knowing that I was Jewish. In other words, she risked her life in order to take me. 
And I lived with her for about four or five months until she became too sick because she suffered from a disease called tuberculosis. I told you before, it destroyed the lungs. She could no longer work. She could no longer support herself and me. And she was desperately looking for some place where I would be safer. And one day walking in the street with me, she came upon a group, of, a small group of nuns. She knew one of the nuns vaguely, and she knew that these nuns looked after blind children. And she went over to this nun, and she begged her, please, she said, take my little girl. You already are looking after children. I can no longer look after her. And she explained to her why she could not, and she begged the nun, please, could you take my little girl? And the nun reluctantly agreed. And I spent the rest of the war years with the nuns. My first memories, really, my own personal memories, because the story that I've been telling you so far, being a two-year-old child at the beginning of the, of the well, at the beginning of my time without my mother, um, I, I don't have many memories. I'm sure you don't remember much when you were that young, too. I think first memories usually surface around the age of four or five or six. Um, and in a way, I'm lucky that I don't have those memories because they really couldn't have been very good memories. Life must have been exceedingly difficult for my family. When the war finally ended, people began to come out of hiding. Those who had miraculously found some shelter and those who had been released from the camps when they were liberated by the Allied forces, by America or by Russia. They were looking desperately to find somebody from their past, a member of their family, a cousin, a friend, a neighbor, in trying to begin to put together some of what was left of their lives. And there were organizations such as the Red Cross that were established, many others as well that were established, and people were invited, were asked, were, were urged to go to these organizations and to report that they were alive, that they had survived, and, and that uh, and register there so that if somebody was looking for that person, they would know where to find them. And I don't know how, but my Aunt Sophie heard my name, because these names were, you know, this is way before computers. I know that you, you can't even imagine what life would be like with a, the phone that's in your pocket, likely and AI and all the other techno technological advances that we've had since then. But at that time, these lists of names were published and sheets of paper that were tied together and they were uh, tied to the remnants of buildings because Warsaw was, 85% of Warsaw was rubble. It was destroyed during the war, totally destroyed. And if you want to think about what it looked like, if you open your TV and you see what the cities in Ukraine look like today, after the war in Ukraine, the war that's going on now between Russia and Ukraine, or if you look at what the Gaza cities look like now, you'll see what Warsaw looked like at that time. So people would line up for, for blocks to have a look at these, looking for someone. And I don't know where, but my aunt heard my name or saw my name, and she went to see whether it was really me before telling my father, because she didn't want him to have false hopes. It could have been some other child. And I remember her coming. And I remember that she came to me and she told me that she was my aunt and that she was going to take me to my daddy. I had no recollection of her. I did not recognize her. I did not remember her. I hadn't seen her for three and a half years. But I was a child of war and I went with her. I left everything that was familiar with the nuns and I went with her. She took me to my daddy. I don't remember that reunion either. Here's a picture of my father, myself, and my aunt Sophie, who lived with us after the war. Her husband was also murdered during the Holocaust. And we lived in a city called Bielsko. We lived in Poland after the war, but we lived as non-Jews. Our Jewish identity was secret. I did not know that I was Jewish. Because even after all the terrible events that were perpetrated on us during the war, on Jews and other people during the war, it was still not safe to live openly as a Jewish person in Poland. In fact, there were pogroms or raids on Jewish communities where people were killed after the war. We wouldn't have been killed more than likely, but my father would not have been appointed as director of a fur 
uh, processing plant. And uh, we would not have been able to live in the lovely apartment that my parents, that my, my father found. And I would have been tormented in school. So my father never told me that we were Jewish. As I told you, Poland is a Catholic country. And I went to a state school, which is a Catholic school. And I studied catechism. I had my first communion. Here you see proof of that. It's a picture of me and my friend Hania on the day of our communion, all decked out in white dresses and wreaths in our hair. And beside it, this is a certificate that I found in the drawer in my stepmother's home when I was dealing with the remnants of her life after she died. Anti-Semitism, as I told you, is a hatred and discrimination against Jewish people. I went to church with my father, without my father, I'm sorry, with our housekeeper. And I loved the church. I loved the stained glass windows. I loved the feeling inside the church, the beauty of it, the peace of it. And I asked my father, please come with me, it's so beautiful, you'll love it. And my father often said, no, I don't go to church. He said, but God is everywhere, and I can pray at home. So I went with our housekeeper. My teacher also often warned us, and I loved school. I was a good student, and I was a good kid, and I listened very carefully, as I told you, I was a child of war. My teacher was often warning us when we were leaving school, saying, don't talk to strangers. On your way home, do not talk to strangers, especially, she said, the Jews, don't talk to the Jews. Why? Because the Jews, she said, were bad people. They had murdered Christ. They had done other terrible things. Of course, that's not true. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a fact that anti-Semites, people who are anti-Semitic, spread that. But it's not a true fact. Jesus Christ was killed by the Romans. Anyway, I was an obedient child, as I told you. I loved school, I loved my teacher. I had no reason not to believe her, especially I wasn't very concerned because I didn't even know what a Jew was. I hadn't even ever met one. So I, it really bore very little meaning to me, except that I shouldn't talk to strangers, especially not to Jews. So my father remarried in 1947. And in December of 1948, we immigrated to Canada, where my father had relatives that had come here before the war. And it was during that crossing, on a ship like you saw in the, in the slides that were, you were shown before, in the film that you were shown before, it was called Stefan Batori. It was on that ship at a very stormy crossing. It was a very bad crossing. I was very sick during that crossing. My father took me aside one day, and as kindly as he knew how, he told me the secret that I was Jewish, that we were Jewish. And I was appalled. I fought with him. I said, no, I can't be Jewish. I'm a Catholic child. I have my first communion. I go to church. It can't be true. But of course it was. It took me many years to become comfortable with my Jewish identity and to take pride in the history of the Jewish people and in all the accomplishments that they contributed to human life and to human endeavor in medicine, in literature, in art, in almost in science for sure, in almost every area of human achievement. But identity is something that is set very early in life and it's a very um, uncomfortable very disturbing to find out that you're not who you thought yourself to be. It was very difficult for me at the age of eight. It's even more difficult for people who are older if they find out that their background is not what they had been raised to think. I grew up in Montreal after the Holocaust, after we came to Canada. And the Holocaust was always present in my family life. Uh, my parents, my stepmother and my father talked very little about it to me. And unfortunately, I wasn't very interested. I asked very little. I didn't ask many questions. And I was very happy to be left out of all conversations pertaining to the Holocaust. I wanted to be a Canadian kid like you and to grow up without this history, really. 
even as an adult, I have not been interested in, um, in returning to Poland or in exploring our family history in any way. But my younger daughter, Felisa, who was named for my mother, had a very keen interest in the Holocaust and its effect on our family. And she urged me, from the time that she was a teenager, to return to Poland. And finally, in 2005, she convinced me. And before I went, I did some research on the internet, and I found three convents that had helped children, that had, that had had children with them during the war. I didn't know if they were Jewish children, there were three convents, and I had been told by my father that I had been saved in a convent in the south of Poland. I called them because I speak Polish and I asked them, and one of the convents, one of the people I spoke to at one of the convents said, yes, they had had children during the Holocaust. Uh, they didn't know that the children were blind, which is what I remembered, but they said they definitely had had children. And when I asked, is anybody still alive who was there then? They said, no, there's nobody, nobody that they could reach out to and ask those questions. But they were quite sure that they were the right place because they had children. I made an appointment for Felisa and me to visit. At the same time, a friend of mine, um, who I worked with at that time, was principal of the school, and she was the principal, vice principal of the high school, and she had a friend who had traveled to Poland and had met a man whose name was Yale Reisner. And Yale was a genealogist. And for those of you who don't know what a genealogist is, that's probably quite a few of you, it's not a word that we see very often. It's a person who studies history in a very specific way using documents and archives, a little bit like some of, the, some of the films that you saw before. All those are old documents. You know, today it's very easy. You get on your computer, you push in Ancestry.com, or you can send in your DNA, you can find out all kinds of information. But this was, even in 2005, which is not ancient history, it's ancient history for you because you weren't born then, but it's not ancient history. Even in those days, you couldn't do it on the computer. So Yale was an American guy living in Poland, and he'd spent 12 years in Poland already doing this, researching people's history. And people often came to him, asking him about, could they, could they find anything out? Could he help them find anything out about what happened to family members during war? So I, when we got to, to Warsaw, I called him. And uh, even though I didn't really think I needed his help, I really called him out of politeness because my friend was coming to Poland for other reasons a little bit later and I just didn't want to feel like, didn't want her to feel that I had disregarded the help that she was trying to give me. So I called Yale and he told me he was very busy but he would be very happy to see me and he was sure that he could help me. So we took a taxi to the Jewish Historical Institute which is actually on part of the grounds of the ghetto, uh, that where the ghetto had been and uh, we called him from the lobby as he had requested. He told us he was still with a family that was... Um, Thank you. He was still with a family that he had been interviewing who had come to see him from Israel. And that he would come to see us in the lobby as soon as he was free. There was an exhibit in that building, an exhibit of photographs from the Warsaw Ghetto, some of the ones that I showed you and many, many others. And it was very dark and very deep, and it was very, very depressing. And we waited and waited, walked around this exhibit, we saw films, we saw artifacts from the war. And it was, when we finished, I looked at my watch and I realized it was four hours. And I ran down to the telephone and I called him again and I said, look, we have to go. He begged us to stay longer, and when we finally got to see him, and I told him that I was hidden in a convent in the south of Poland, he got very excited. He jumped out of his chair, and he ran to a bookcase that was filled with books, maybe a thousand books, and from that thousand books, he picked up one book. It was called, in English, the title in English was, Your, Your Life is Worth Mine. And it was written by a woman whose name is Eva Korek. She submitted it as a PhD thesis for her to, to receive her PhD. And what it does, it's not a storybook, it's a book that is written in small paragraphs. And each paragraph names a convent where a Jewish child was saved by the nuns, or by priests. So it's really like a documentary book. And she did it in order to show how many Jews were saved in Poland. And it's true that Poland had the largest Jewish population before the war. It's also true that more Jews were, were saved in Poland than in any other country in Europe. 
So he ran to this bookshelf, he got this book, he started to flip through the, through the pages, murmuring to himself, I've heard this before, I've heard somebody mention this, I must, must be in this book, and he was flipping through the pages, and he came to the page which he read to us, a paragraph that he read to us, and I'll read you the translation. Congregation of Franciscan Sisters, Sisters and Servants of the Cross, a Polish order of nuns, established in 1918, for the purpose of caring for and educating blind children. In 1939, 106 nuns worked in 18 homes, and in Zakopane, a sister, whose name was, that's one of the nuns, whose name was Clara Yamashinska, saved the life of one Jewish little girl. We were speechless because we were convinced that this was the right convent, and that this little girl had to be me. Yale gave me the contact information, and after some difficulties, I managed to reach somebody there. And the nun that I spoke to invited us, please, she said, come. And while I was talking to her, I said to her, is it possible that somebody who was there, the same question I had asked of the other convent, is it possible that somebody who was there at that time, which at that time was 60 years before, is it possible that somebody is still alive? And the nun that I was speaking to said, yes, in fact, Sister Clara Yaroshinska, that's a name that, I had, that Yale had read, is alive. And we were, we were just, we were so excited. And I said, how old is she? She said, she's 94. I said, what is she like? What's her health like? She said, she's well. She's been blind for the last five years of her life because she suffers from a disease called glaucoma. But otherwise, her brain is clear, her mind is clear, her memory is excellent, and so is her sense of humor. She said, you must come. And so we did. Lasky is where they have these nuns, sister, Franciscan sisters. See, my father told me I was safe in a convent, but really these nuns don't, don't work in a convent. They work in the Institute for the Blind in a place called Lasky. Oops, I forgot this, and we don't have much time, so I'll tell you quickly. Um, this is what Umschlagplatz looks like today. Remember I showed you the picture before where people were gathered on each side waiting to be loaded onto the cattle cars. This is now a monument, and this wall here is a marble wall engraved with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of names only the given names, because for every Eva, for every Jan Janice, for every George, for every Stan, there are, there could be hundreds, and there was a fruit on this wall. When I travel to Poland, which I've done nine times, I often tell my story to the group that I'm with at this place. It's very meaningful to me. Here you see Sister Clara. We were taken to the house where the older nuns lived. And Sister Clara came out, accompanied on each side, held up on each side, holding the arms of two younger nuns. And when she was told that we were there, she opened her arms like this and welcome, and I ran into them. And we held each other, and we both cried. And you have to remember that I was a child of two. By the time I left them, I wasn't even six. And I didn't remember anything about her. Not her name, not her face, not her voice, nothing. And yet when I was in her arms, I felt like I had come home. I felt this incredible feeling of love. It was very powerful. I don't know how to explain that, because as I said, I have no conscious memory of her. And yet somewhere in my being, I had, I had stored the emotional memory of her, is what I call it. Somewhere in my being, I had, I, had, I had stored this memory of this loving woman and how important she had been in my life at the time that I needed her most. So we sat together, we both cried, we shared memories. Many of my memories were quite accurate, and I wish I could have time to tell you a little bit more about them because they were really interesting. We were poor, we had very little to eat. The nuns would beg the farmers around us to uh, give them something, and we would often have meals of nothing but potatoes or nothing but carrots. Um, but we, we survived. The other children were all blind, so we had different systems. Nobody knew 
that the nuns were hiding a Jewish child, but when the Nazis would come around to that area looking for uh, food for their crops, for their uh, uh, troops, uh, somebody from the village would run up to our farmhouse to, look, to alert the nuns that the Nazis were around. Not because anybody knew that they were hiding a Jewish child, because nobody did, but because it was important for them to hide whatever was valuable, because the Nazis were confiscated, but taken. And so, of course, the first thing that they hid was me, and this I do remember. They hid me in a little excavation, a hole that had been dug in the earthen floor of the farmhouse in which we lived. And I, as a tiny child, was told to scrunch up and to get into this hole. And on top of it was placed a board and a mat and a table on top of that. And I was told that I had to remain absolutely still and silent. Absolutely silent for all the time that the Nazis were around. Fortunately, since we had so little, the inspections didn't take, or the visit of the Nazis didn't take very long. They took whatever they wanted, and there wasn't much to take, and so as soon as they were gone, I was free to emerge again and to, to live among the other children. As I told you, all of them were boys, all of them were blind. Sister Clara died in 2010. At the age of at the age of 99, here's a picture of me with Sister Clara. I visited her again. I visited her three more times. So in total, I saw her four, four times before she died, and I talked to her on the phone about every three weeks. This is a picture of my family, my other daughter and her family, and we were together, 11 of us, and not 11 in the picture, but we were 11 people who went, because everybody in my family was so, so amazed and excited by this miracle of having found this woman. So I visited her again in 2007, as you see, and again in 2009, when a German filmmaker made a film which included my story, and part of the film was filmed with Sister Clara. Her mind at that point was not as clear as it had been in my first two visits in 2005 and 2007, but she was still able to participate in the film. And then I visited her for the fourth time, which was the last time when that same film was screened at the Jewish Museum in Berlin. Imagine that. A film about three Jewish children's lives that were saved by righteous Gentiles made by a German filmmaker to be screened in Berlin, Hitler's city, at the Jewish Museum that now stands there. It was a monumentous event in my life. And I went accompanied by two friends. Sister Clara and her, uh, her parents were listed among the righteous, um, righteous among the nations by Yad Vashem. Because Israel became a country in 1948, and it was shortly after that date that in 1953, the Yad Vashem uh, was opened, and at the same time, uh, at the same time, they created a designation called Righteous Among the Nations in order to honor all the Gentiles, all the people who are not Jewish, who save, who save Jewish lives with no payment. They didn't accept any gifts, any money for that deed. They simply did what was morally right. Incredible people like the Renaissance that you've heard about, and many others. My reunion with Sister Clara deeply changed my life. It made me very aware of the two precious gifts she had given me. She had obviously saved my life, which was one of many miracles that allows me to be here today. But she had also given me the gift of love. And no child of three or two can survive without love until she's six and become a whole person, a person who is loving and caring and can carry on a life that is, that is uh, rounded and complete. You can see how emotional this was. And here I end with a slide of Treblinka. This is what Treblinka, the death camp, looks like now. This is the killing camp, what's left of it. There's nothing left of it because the Nazis destroyed the whole camp when they left. But what's left of it today is a monument, this large monument that you see in the middle. Um, and surrounded it, surrounding it are stones of various sizes. They're not carved, they're very rough hewn stones. And most of them have names of places on them. Uh, 
places are places from which people were taken in Poland and the surrounding countries to be brought to Treblinka to be murdered. And this is the memorial to all those people, and it's a very moving place. I would love to leave some time for questions for you. Um, I think that that's an important part, and I wonder whether you have any questions. If not, I have a couple of other little remarks. So, if you have any questions, there are two mics set up in the aisle, and I would really appreciate if one of you was really brave and stood up to the mic. The first question is always the hardest, and it may help other people to think of things that they would like to know. Because you are the last, as Mark told, Mark told you, you are the last generation of young people to ever hear the story of the Holocaust from the person who survived it. Your children, when you grow up and have them, will not have that opportunity. There is technology that will allow them to hear testimonies that are recorded, or even on new technology, that it's very lifelike, but it's not the real thing. So, please, if you have a question, come up to the mic, be brave. Oh, good. We have a brave person. Go ahead. I was just wondering, what was the, what was the race that Germans found superior in World War II? What were they called again? The Aryan race. Um, I was just wondering, when your um, aunt passed away? When I passed away? No, when your aunt passed away. Your aunt. aunt. Your aunt. Your aunt. Sophie. Sophie. Aunt. Oh, my aunt Sophie? Yes. She survived the war and she lived, uh, I think she was 90 when she died. She oh. was in Canada. She lived in Canada. She lived not far from us. Hi. Hi. Um, how much did the death of Clara the nun have an impact upon you? I think that her life had more effect than her death. She was, she was pretty old, and by the time she died, her mind was not very clear, nor was her memory. She still recognized me when I came the last time, but if I'd had the opportunity, had she lived another year, I would have come for her 100th birthday, and I don't know whether she would have known me then. Her presence in the world made a huge difference to me, but her death was inevitable. She was almost 100 years old. Thank you, that's a very sensitive question. Um, I forget, one of the war end? 1945. 1945, in May 1945. This presentation you have given us has given us a, a very good understanding of what the Holocaust truly means and what it represents. Thank you. And I would like to ask, well, because of this presentation, what would you like us to spread around and, I don't know. What a great question. Permeate through. Uh, When you hear people denying that the Holocaust happened, which happens sometimes, you have to say to them, you're wrong. When I was a kid, I met a woman who survived it and who told us her story. It did happen. Because, you know, the, fortunately for us, in a way, the Germans were very good, the Nazis were very good at keeping records. But history erases, gets erased after a time. And the reason that I do this is to bring you the story, to bring you the history, to make you feel responsible for being witnesses. Because now you've heard my story. And it's not going to be long before nobody is alive. What happened here or what happened there. But you remember my story because stories are very powerful. And the other thing that I want you to remember is personal responsibility. Because even though you're young people, you all have witnessed injustice in your lives, whether it's in family, whether it's on the bus, whether it's on the school grounds. I want you to be aware of your responsibility as a human being to stand up 
for the person who is being bullied, for the person who is being harmed in some way. Not necessarily, certainly not, I wouldn't want you to say to, to risk your life, but to alert someone, to get help, to show support for the person. That is what I want you to take away from here. Now, ask the question right now. If you have a question for Eva, which is a personal question or something from her experience, go ahead. But if it is a history question, maybe uh, pass your turn. Thank you, Mark. Um, I'm, I'm sorry that, we, that we're out of time, really, or almost out of time. And I so I want to tell you, all of you who are in line waiting to ask a question, it makes me feel good, and this is one of the reasons that I do what I do. Because the question part is the, my favorite part of telling my story. Go ahead. When you um, were a kid, you found out you were like a um, Jew because you always thought you were Catholic. How did that like make you feel? How does it make me feel that I started out life thinking that I was a Catholic? Yeah. I think that. How does it make me feel? It makes me feel. I think that what it's done for me is it made me more open to people of every faith, of every color, of every background. Because you know, we are all human beings. And we want the same things from life. All human beings want to be safe. They want to have shelter, they want to have food, they want to have an education, they want to have peace. We share all that. The other things that separate us and that cause wars and conflicts between people, those things are much less important, and yes, they take on a huge importance, as you see today, because our world is a very, very difficult place, and it's living through a very difficult time in history. So I think that, in a way, it was important in my life, and it, it paid, played a part. Thank you. Were you sad when you didn't see them when you went back? 
I don't remember that either, but there were certainly more than one nun. Sister Clara was the one that was in charge, and there were probably three or four other nuns. And I kind of remembered a lot of blind boys that were with us, but she said there were only about ten. So she was in charge of this little group of uh, two or three nuns, me, those boys, and a priest. Thank you. Uh, did you have any friends while you were at, while you No, I don't remember any of the children particularly. And I did not have any contact with them after the war. Do you have any item from your mom and dad? If you do, do you keep it in a place that feels safe to you? I have a lot of things that my dad touched and held that belonged to him. I have only one thing from my mother. The day that I was born, my father wrote a letter to my Aunt Gert, who lived in New York, that I told you about, he wrote a letter announcing the fact that I was born. And my grandmother, my mother's mother, had come to help her. And at the bottom of that letter that my father wrote, there's one sentence written by my mother in her handwriting, and another couple of sentences written by my grandmother. That is the only thing that I had, and I gave the original copy of that letter to the Montreal Holocaust Museum for safekeeping. Thank you. You know what, I really appreciate the appreciation that you're showing, but if we cut out the clapping, we can get to more questions, okay? You can clap at the end as you're leaving, because I know you have buses to catch. Um, are there also Ashkenazi Jews, or are there only Sephardic Jews in the concentration camps? Well, as you heard from Dr. Phillips' presentation, the war took place in, in North Africa as well, and that was a place where most uh, Sephardi Jews lived. In the Warsaw Ghetto, there were mostly Ashkenazis, I would say almost 100%. Thank you. Um, there's a question from Sister Clara. Um, what happened to the Jewish people? Do I remember what happened when I lost my dad? Yeah. Or my dad lived to be... Huh? Or what happened the last time? Do I remember what happened the last time I saw my father? Well, I was actually I was away when he died. I was on a trip with my husband, and my father had been ill for about 11 years, and I hardly traveled during that time. And I was convinced that, you know, I should, I should resume my life and not sort of stay home and wait for him to die. And he was really quite well when I left, but he unexpectedly died during my absence. So the last time that I saw him, he was sitting in the sun in his, on the, on the uh, patio of his home and looking quite well and quite happy and wishing me a good trip. It was very hard to lose him when I was away. And the trip home was quite difficult. But he was 84, which is very old. I'm 83, and I hope that I'll beat him in terms of how long I live. But uh, it's always sad when you lose someone that you love, and I was very attached to him. Thank you. Yes. So, you see that when you that person that had taken you in, you felt like you emotionally remembered her, right? Well, do you feel that when you were like mad at your father? I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Can you repeat it, please? So, like when you found that had taken you in when you were little, you said you just, like emotionally remembered her almost, right? Like you felt emotions like that you felt when you were little when you met her? When I met Sister Clara? Yeah. Did you feel like anything like that when you were like, we met with your father when you were little? I don't remember the reunion with my father, as I told you. In terms of my emotions when I met Sister Clara, they were very, it was very emotional. I was, I'm forever grateful to have had the last uh, five years of her life, to have forged a real connection with her and to have been able to express my gratitude to her for her incredible goodness and for her courage 
and uh, kindness to me and love for me. Can you repeat the question, please? How do you feel when you meet a Jewish hater? How do I feel when I meet a Jewish hater? How do you feel when you said anti Semites, someone who is anti Have you ever met someone who is anti Semite? Someone who is anti Semite? An anti Semite? How do I feel? You know, people are entitled to their opinions. And people who are anti-Semitic have reasons for those feelings. Those feelings are not just I mean, the feelings. Everybody's feelings belong to them, and I have no I have no right to take those feelings away. What I'm trying to do is show them the humanity for both of us, that we are very similar to each other, that the things that are important about each of us we have in common. And anti-Semitism is learned. There are no babies that are born hating. Babies, children are taught to hate. And the reason that I talk to groups like yours is to show you the dangers, the terror that hate is capable of engendering. It was hate of the other and a thirst for power, a hunger for power that created a conflict that was the Holocaust and that's creating a conflict now. Last question. Uh, what year did you uh, arrive in the ghetto, and what uh, year did you leave the ghetto? We arrived in, in the ghetto probably uh, when I was just a few months old. I was born in 1940 in February, and I think that the ghetto was established uh, uh, in, in the spring of that year, so probably I was a few months old. And we left the ghetto in 1942, the end of 1942. My mother was taken, I believe it was in September. We probably left very shortly after that. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much.